are careening toward a crisis in the Capitol just over 48 hours now until the government shuts down. With that countdown, the backdrop to a fiery first step toward possibly impeaching President Biden, with Republican star witness not exactly delivering. So what's next for Congress and for the president and for our economy and our government? We're live on the Hill in just a minute. We're also live in Baltimore with very scary new details on how the suspected killer first came across the young tech CEO he's accused of murdering. What we're learning from these new documents and the questions tonight over the police response. Plus, oil prices today spiking to the highest they've been in more than a year. What it means for gassing up and for turning on the heat with winter right around the corner. And the rise of steroid talk. Videos seen by millions of younger men encouraging them to use steroids with one group sounding the alarm why they want the feds to step in. Then, if you're still getting your DVDs in that signature red envelope, you are officially vintage, because those envelopes are too. An obituary of sorts for the very last shipment from Netflix, and how that company is still hoping to change the business of entertainment a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and right now Congress is running out of time. They are straight up against the clock with a little more than 48 hours to go to avoid a big government shutdown that could mean trouble for millions of Americans, for our economy, inside and outside the Beltway. Right now, you've got this intense fight over whether or not House Republicans might be able to come to some kind of 11th hour deal. We are not at the 11th hour yet. That's not going to come till Saturday night, but boy... Are we creeping closer and closer to the lights turning off? Again, stroke of midnight early Sunday. That's when the switch flips. In the middle of all this drama, right, this is the backdrop to the House's first impeachment inquiry against President Biden. It is just wrapping up in just the last couple of minutes on Capitol Hill with some questions from Democrats about whether it should even be happening at all. Fireworks, surprises in this Republican-led investigation that's basically trying to tie the president to business dealings related to his son, Hunter. And the big takeaway from today, the star witnesses, Republicans calling up to testify, one of them saying they're really not sure there's enough evidence here to go forward. Watch. I do not believe that the current evidence would support articles of impeachment. That is something that an inquiry has to establish. I am not here today to even suggest that there was corruption, fraud, or any wrongdoing. In my opinion, more information needs to be gathered and assessed before I would make such an assessment. Ali Vitali is live for us on Capitol Hill, watching every minute of what ended up being a marathon first impeachment inquiry against the yeah. president. Let me start, because we got two things, right? And they are interrelated. We've got the impeachment inquiry. We've got a shutdown. We saw the nexus today with Democrats, for example, holding up a prop, a countdown clock, essentially saying, Republicans, this is about to happen. Why are you worried about this from President Biden? Talk us through that dynamic and how close we really are to the government shutting down. We're close, Hallie. There's no way around that. I've not spoken to a Republican or a Democratic lawmaker today who isn't under the assumption that they'll, A, be working the weekend, and that, B, the weekend will end in a government shutdown. There are still multiple impasses between McCarthy and the key holdouts who have been thorns in his side, frankly, for this entire process. And so certainly when you say we're careening towards a crisis, we're still on that track. I do think that I heard from some Republicans today who were at least chagrined by the fact that this impeachment inquiry is coming when the focus should be on the shutdown. Then again, these things are put on the schedule and they are allowed to continue forward because they're already on the schedule. That's one of the things that I think allowed Democrats to score some political points is making it look like Republicans are distracted from the actual task of governing and keeping the lights on here. But the other piece of this, too, is the fact that Democrats were able to highlight that the key Republican witnesses who were here, none of them are firsthand witnesses that can tie the evidence and allegations from Republicans directly to President Joe Biden. That's one of the things that Democrats are trying to underscore. And the other piece of this, too, was the ways in which the Democrats, specifically Jamie Raskin, the ranking member, were able to disrupt the flow of this hearing. Mm -hmm. There were multiple times where he was able to get Chairman Comer to have to go around and count votes and do motions, and that really disrupted the flow of Republicans' ability to build momentum and a narrative here. It feels to me, Ali, that one of the analogies that has been useful here, and we've heard it referenced from people on both sides of the aisle, is the idea of smoke and fire, right? Because there is, as Republicans yeah. would acknowledge, 
there is smoke, they say. They argue that there is a fire there, right? That some of these questions around Hunter Biden's yeah. business dealings, they feel, they infer, would be connected to President Biden. To be clear, they have presented no evidence of that. There has been no evidence put forward, right. as we heard from Jonathan Turley and some of the other Republican witnesses here. Democrat, Democrats are saying... There's no fire, right? Smoke, but no fire here. I mean, that is that is part of what is central to this. Um, talk me through how you are hearing it from your sources and how they're framing this. Or in the words of Jamie Raskin, that there's a, a smoke and a smoking gun, but there's no gun and there's no smoke from that gun. Hmm. There's a million ways that they're trying to say it. And it's also a question that I posed to Chairman Comer as he was leaving this hearing room just in the last few minutes about the idea that it might be hard when your star witnesses are saying you don't have enough for impeachment, but this is what he told me. This isn't an impeachment here. I've never said impeachment. People ask, would you vote to impeach? I would vote to impeach. My job is to determine how much money the Biden's got, and I think I'm doing a good job with that. I think this committee's doing a good job with that. So Comer underscoring the obvious here, which is that it's an inquiry. It's not a full impeachment. But at the same time, this is the double-edged sword of where Republicans are right now. Yes, they're getting what they wanted in that they're doing an impeachment inquiry. But if they don't have the votes to move forward on impeachment, they are effectively neutralizing this idea of corruption against President Joe Biden as a narrative in the 24 election. And that's one of the key things that they're trying to accomplish here with these hearings. What's the political risk reward on that, Ali, especially given that some of our new NBC News polling shows that more than half of Americans oppose this impeachment inquiry moving forward? The political reward is that this is what conservatives, especially in the base, really wanted to see. And this is what Speaker McCarthy did to try to appease people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and others. His idea was to try to let some of the steam out of the pot so that those hardliners might come along on a shutdown or avoiding one more easily. That's not what happened here. And so now we're in the period of we'll see what the risk ends up being. The risk is that Americans could look at this Republican majority and think they're more concerned with going after their opposition than they are with the business of governing the country. Ali Vitale, live for us on the Hill, where there are lots of moving pieces. We'll look for an update from you, Ali, in just a little so, bit. Thank you so much. Let's bring it to Baltimore now, where we're just learning new details about the hours before that young CEO tech star was allegedly brutally murdered in her home in Baltimore. Charging documents that we're just getting a look at say that security camera footage showed Pavel LaPere getting home late one night last week. She was sitting on her apartment lobby couch. And that's when the suspect, now under arrest in this case, Jason Billingsley, waved from outside. She apparently, as you can see here, she goes to the door to let him in. Police say the two are then seen on video riding the elevator together. Billingsley is later seen leaving the building alone. It wasn't until three days later on Monday that LaPere's body was found on her roof. Police say a brick, blood, buttons, teeth, some of her clothes were found at the crime scene as well. We're also just learning the police had been monitoring Billingsley for days. They even had a warrant out for his arrest for allegedly raping a woman days before he allegedly killed LaPere. He is now in police custody. Captured at a train station about 30 miles from Baltimore. Police acknowledging they know that is small consolation for the people who loved LaPere. I know this arrest does not bring back Pavel LaPere or take away the heels of the many victims of Mr. Billingsley. We're going to put this individual, this violent criminal offender, repeat offender, back in jail where he belongs. I want to bring in Ron Allen, who is live for us in Baltimore. And, Ron, these new charging documents are giving us more of a sense of what police say happened. Tell us more. It doesn't tell us why it happened, though. It doesn't tell us what the interaction was between LaPere and the suspect Billingsley. Yes, the documents describe how, for some reason, she let him into this building where she lived and worked in the heart of Baltimore. Uh, and then they're seen going together on this elevator, and her body is discovered on the roof later. Uh, and the cause of death, according to the medical examiner, is strangulation and blunt force trauma. And as you described, there are a number of things found on the roof, including a brick. So we're piecing together what apparently happened, but why remains unclear. Uh, and the police are still saying that there is no apparent connection between Billingsley and LaPierre. In other words, they didn't know each other. There's no, there's nothing that puts them together that connects them uh, until this horrific incident happens uh, there at the place where she lived and worked. Allie.
How about the questions on accountability uh, here? Because police, as, as you've been reporting, had him under surveillance. How, how much, um, where was there a disconnect if police had been supposed to have been monitoring him and yet this still allegedly happened? Well, they say they had him under surveillance. They say they were tracking him because of this other alleged crime that had happened about a week before the Le Pair murder. It was a case involving attempted murder, rape, and arson uh, that the police say Billingsley allegedly targeted a couple and their child for some unknown reason. And they said that because this was a targeted case, they didn't alert the public generally about the danger of this individual. Uh, and that's that's why uh, they didn't uh, put out uh, bulletins or, or have a press conference or raise alarm bells about him. Uh, but despite all that, they're saying that now uh, they are definitely going to put him away uh, for the rest of their life, for the rest of his life, if they can. That's the goal. Here's some of what the state's attorney had to say. Take a listen. Our hope and goal is if this individual is found guilty in a court of law, that this individual will never get out to see the light of day again and to ever hurt any of the citizens of our fine city ever again. And he is in jail now, awaiting his next court date, which we don't know when that will be just yet. But again, no bond and, uh, and no plea as far as we know. Allie. Ron Allen live for us there in Baltimore. Ron, thank you very much. Let's bring you to Philadelphia now, a city bracing for whatever may happen tonight after another night of widespread looting across the city. Take a look at some of this security video just into NBC News. This is a group of people that are coming in. They, this is like a beauty supply store. They come in. Smash the window, you see the glass falling there. Apparently they go, they start grabbing as much as they can carry, then they all kind of jog out. Police there are now counting eight more burglaries in just the last 24 hours, six more arrests. That's only a day after that first wave of violent break-ins across the city. You see the aftermath, a bunch of stores vandalized. Some totally cleared out of what they were selling because so much was stolen. With local officials now putting at least some of the blame on a popular social media influencer saying she influenced others by live streaming all the chaos as it was happening and, in their words, inciting a riot. You see her here, Deja Blackwell, she's more commonly known as Meatball Online, talking with one of our affiliates in just the last hour or so. Listen. I just prefer, you know, never loot again, stay out of trouble, and never go to jail. George Solis is joining us now live from Philadelphia. Give us a sense as we head into what police hope is certainly not night number three of the potential for more problems here. Are they considering things like a curfew? I know that liquor stores have been shut down previously. What's your sense? Yeah, Hallie, certainly they're hoping for not a repeat of what they saw over the last two nights. No curfew as of yet, but police continue to monitor the situation. And obviously they continue to monitor social media, which seems to be the linchpin in all of this activity that they saw over the last two days. 50 arrests, more than 50 arrests were made as a result of this looting. A lot of adults jumping into stores like the Apple one here behind me, which is still closed. Remarkably though, some stores have been able to reopen. Some of those liquor stores that you showed also reopening, but a majority of them, at least 10, according to officials that I've spoken with, will remain closed because of the widespread damage. We were at one of those stores and it was completely wiped in. Frankly, some people were still going into the store, even with police still around and still looting at this hour, if you can believe that. So obviously mm. police have a lot of work ahead of them. They are hoping for not a third night but of course, in all of this, you can't forget about the business owners who are impacted. A lot of these are small business owners, like that beauty supply shop owner that you uh, showed there earlier. She was heartbroken by all of this. You know, she got a call at 1 a.m. that her store was being ransacked. This is, you know, her community. She figures they would protect her store. And a lot of people just let it happen. They stood idly by as people ransacked her store. It was a very emotional interview for her. I want you to take a listen to some of our exchange. I've been working for over three years to save, to open, to get this open for over three years. I work overnight, days, six, seven days a week, so I could get this to here. And this is what happened. Yeah, her store is now open. It is boarded up. She says she's going to stay there and hopefully deliver that message that she is not going to give up on her community, Hallie. Yeah. You know, you talked about the idea of the social media impact of some of this here. We talked about that influencer who is now, from what it appears, based on that video from our affiliate, out, right, after being arrested? Yeah, she made bail about uh, $25,000. Uh, she only had to pay 10% of that, but she still faces a slew of charges, including criminal conspiracy, criminal mischief and rioting, and disorderly conduct. Of course, 
At this point, she has not had to enter a plea deal. That will have to happen during her preliminary hearing set later this month. But she did seem remorseful in that exchange with our affiliate WCAU here, saying she obviously didn't want this kind of attention, but it's obviously on her right now, Hallie. George Solis, thank you very much. Oil prices are starting to tick down a bit today after hitting their highest levels in more than a year. And some experts say they think those prices are going to stay up, stay elevated for the next few months yet. So now we wait, right? And we hope that that trickle down doesn't cost us more for gas and cost us more to heat our homes, even as winter's just around the corner. CNBC senior analyst Ron Insana is joining us now. So this movement here in oil prices, Ron, how should we be thinking about it from the consumer level? In other words, this is not the time when I would expect my gas to get more expensive. Should I be right. bracing for that? Yeah, I think so, uh, Ali. I mean, we mm -hmm. could be looking at $4 gasoline quite easily across the country with um, crude oil sitting well above $90 a barrel. And in London, it's traded as high as 95 a consequence of OPEC and Russia together cutting production by a million barrels a day and extending that production cut throughout the remainder of the year. And so that's at a time when supplies in the United States are at 40-year lows. So we've got this supply-demand imbalance that favors, sadly, higher prices. Supply, demand, what is going to change on the supply end of things, right? What is the anticipation here? Well, we're producing actually a lot. Uh, the U.S. is back towards record levels, 12.9 million barrels a day, probably will top 13 million next year. But that is not enough to offset uh, the drawdown in crude oil inventories we've seen in the U.S. over the last year and also these OPEC production cuts that uh, have been quite sticky over the last many months and look to continue well into possibly early 2024. What about home heating oil? Uh, is anything going to change in time for, let's say, you know, late October when it starts to get a little chilly? So it depends how your house is, in fact, heated. If it's heating oil, those prices are up, which is a derivative of, of crude oil itself. If it's natural gas, those prices have been uh, el relatively well contained. So really depends on the mechanism uh, that you use to heat your house. Natural gas, you're better off. Heating oil, you might face a higher price come the wintertime. Ron and Sana, thanks for watching all of it with some of that movement tonight. Appreciate it. We're also learning tonight it could be something like a year and a half before we get any answers, if ever, from Maui's electric provider on what role it may have played in sparking those devastating wildfires. Because at a congressional hearing today, we heard one official not commit to turning over all the results that come from this ongoing investigation. Listen. Are willing to commit to make those results public once the investigation is completed. I think it's too early to speculate on exactly what comes out of this and what form it comes out, but we are committed to sharing what's critical uh, with the public on this. Is there any reason why you wouldn't make it public? I mean, I, you seem to be hesitating a little bit. I think it's just too early to speculate. Hawaiian Electric is facing multiple lawsuits claiming its power lines started that horrific wildfire in Maui early last month. It was a firestorm that killed at least 97 people and incinerated 2,000 buildings. The power company, though, says that its lines were actually de-energized and had been for hours before that second fire, the destructive one, the one that destroyed Lahaina, as you see, actually started. No word yet on the official cause of that fire. I want to bring in Dana Griffin for more on this. And this is something that we talked about when those wildfires first started, Dana. This was going to be a long slog towards some kind of accountability for people who lost quite literally everything in these fires. Yeah, and Hallie, when we talk about why this report may not be released, you, you got to understand that this report, once it's completed, could either help or hurt the utility. You know, while they're trying to get to the bottom of what went wrong, they're also facing litigation right now. So that's possibly why they aren't committing to releasing that full report once it is finally revealed. Now, there were no major bombshells dropped during the hearing today, but Hawaiian Electric CEO once again admitted to the first fire that happened that morning was caused by one of their power lines that fell down and it sparked about a three acre fire that they were told was distinguished and contained. And she says that the power lines were de-energized during that period. Well, an afternoon fire started and that is what spread across Lahaina. And there's no, a cause has not been determined for that fire. There were also discussions about grounding power lines so that this tragedy doesn't happen again. And the thing about that is that's very costly and consumers, Hallie, would have to fit the bill.
The timing of this is, I think, notable here because we are seeing even just this week people finally getting able to go back to their homes in the hardest hit area of Maui here, West Maui, and see what happened. Um, and it's those people that are in many ways at the center of the story and, of course, should be centered in the story, too. Absolutely. And going back, seeing the destruction, even though they may never get to live in that home again, at least as it stands, it's part of the healing and recovery process that so many Maui residents have asked for. They know that they need to go back in, see it for themselves. And that's part of the closure. One Maui resident spoke about what that experience was like. Listen. It's pretty bad. <laughs> After so many years of living here. I just can't say it. And I think you really need to just see, we need to see it in person. We need to go and stand on our property. And you know, Hallie, what's also adding to the frustration here and the concern is that looming government shutdown, that will halt what the recovery and the, the cleanup efforts in Lahaina, and that will be devastating for this community if they don't get the resources that they need. Uh, there have been calls to help fund, the, help fund FEMA so that those funds can still flow in. Hallie. Dana Griffin live for us there out west. Dana, thank you. New details tonight from inside a pretty tense meeting that saw an indicted sitting senator speak for the first time to a room filled with his Democratic colleagues here. We are, of course, talking about Bob Menendez, who's facing those federal bribery charges. And according to sources in the room, Mr. Menendez was saying, despite calls from dozens of his fellow senators, he's not going anywhere. One senator inside that room says Menendez told them, I'm not going to give you my defense. I'm going to defend myself. I'm not resigning. That's not really what at least 30 of his colleagues are hoping to hear. They've all come out, everybody you see on the screen, saying, yes, Menendez, they think, should step down because of that indictment on bribery charges. All of it. Tracking with what we heard from the senator himself. Listen. We'll continue to cast votes on behalf of the people of New Jersey, as I have for 18 years. Oh, and I'm oh, sure oh. when they need those votes, they'll be looking forward for me to cast those votes. And yet one of Menendez's harshest critics... Pennsylvania Senator John Fetterman, also a Democrat, of course, didn't even bother to show up. He said there was really no point. Listen. I didn't go to the lunch. I refused to because the only thing that if he has something to say, it's like, you know, he's resigning. That's the only honorable exit. Excuse me, exit. And he's got to go. He's got to go. I can't imagine, you know, how he could possibly explain any of that kind of a thing. So meeting over now, you've got 20 Senate Democrats left who will now decide if they would like to, whether or not they should join their colleagues who say Menendez should step down. You see three members of the Ethics Committee there. They're recusing themselves from opinions, essentially. But Senator Chuck Schumer, the top Senate Democrat, huge question mark on him here. Let's get right to Capitol Hill live with our reporter who is there. I want to bring in NBC's Julie Serkin, who's been following the ins and outs of this for us. It feels like that is one of the key pieces of this. What is Chuck Schumer going to do? He's the leader of this caucus here, the leader of this conference. He said yesterday he was waiting to hear from Menendez in the meeting. Did he like what he heard or not? Yeah, that's not clear, and that is the big question. You're right. I even pressed him yesterday multiple times. I said, listen, you have your number two Senate Democrat, you have your colleagues in the House all calling on him to resign, and he said he would leave his comments on that. But it doesn't sound like Menendez was very convincing in the room. In fact, I'm told, uh, uh, along with my colleagues Frank and Elizabeth, that he didn't even get any questions in the room. He spoke for less than 15 minutes. Senators looked around at each other sort of awkwardly, according to one of my sources, waiting for somebody to be the first to ask a question of Menendez. Ultimately, nobody did, but afterwards, the senators we spoke to said he didn't do much to change their minds. Here's Tim Kaine. Here's what he told us after the meeting. Senator Menendez addressed us. Um, there, there wasn't Q&A or anything like that, but I'm, I, I don't really want to talk about it yet. Do you feel like he should resign? Um, I've answered that question already. Uh, the charges are disqualifying, if true, but anybody who is facing a charge uh, in our system gets to contest the charge. Now, Fetterman also told me, you heard from him at the top, uh, that Menendez is either going to go by conviction in court or the election. Of course, Menendez up for re-election next year. Um, what's the Senate going to be like for him? I mean, I, I, there, there's a little bit of a sense of like, okay, 30 of your colleagues don't want you there. Whose lunch table are you going to sit at? Especially considering he's already off the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the powerful committee that he previously chaired. And there's this open question on, can he even get access to the same information that his fellow Democrats are getting? 
And that's something Senator Ben Cardin, who is taking over as chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, said he's actually going to look into. But look, from Menendez Clark, he didn't miss any votes yet this week. He showed up this morning to a finance committee hearing, still part of all these lunches and privy to all of the information that senators are getting, at least out of the secure level for now. And it looks like Menendez, defiant, is going to keep doing what he's doing unless the courts tell him otherwise, right? So Menendez is going to continue showing up to hearings, showing up to d d uh, lunch with his colleagues. He's not going to resign. I'm told by a source very close to him he's going to fight these charges and he's going to fight them in the court of public opinion up here as well. Julie Serkin, live for us on the Hill. Appreciate it. We're just learning that former President Trump and his adult children are expected to be called as witnesses in his New York civil fraud trial, expected to start Monday after a judge today denied his bid to try to push that timeline back a bit. The list from the New York Attorney General, Letitia James, includes 28 names, including the former president, his kids, his adult children, Don Jr., Eric Trump, Ivanka Trump, former confidants Michael Cohen, Alan Weisselberg. Mr. Trump's legal team has submitted its own list, which also includes the former president, making the possibility he takes the stand even likelier. The New York AG wants $250 million for claims that Mr. Trump and his company illegally inflated the value of their assets on financial forms, something that Mr. Trump denies. Remember, this is a civil trial. We will keep you posted on that starting Monday. To some developing news just before we went on the air, Tesla now getting sued for allegedly tolerating racial harassment of its black workers and retaliating against those who spoke out about it. This is a suit coming from the EEOC. You've probably seen that around your workplace, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. It includes claims from a black worker at the Fremont, California plant, who says people were using what they describe as the N-word all the time, especially men and particularly white men. It claims Tesla failed and refused to take steps to address that behavior. Tesla did not immediately respond to CNBC's request for comment. David Ingram, our tech reporter, is on this one. What else do we know about this? Ali, this uh, lawsuit filed today goes into great detail about some of what black workers at Tesla's factory here in California said that they faced on a regular basis. Uh, this one worker is quoted in the complaint saying that when he would uh, take breaks and go to the restroom or the break room, that he would see uh, the N-word and other um, racial epithets um, uh, scrawled all over uh, the walls, um, saying, saying that he would see uh, a swastika, the N-word. He said it was so gross and racist, I don't want to talk about it. But they would say, kill black people. Now, uh, the EEOC says this has been going on for more than eight years at the Fremont factory, which is about an hour east of here in California. I'm in, I'm in San Francisco. And um, uh, the, Tesla actually has known that this suit was coming for more than a year. They had been in discussions with the EEOC. The EEOC says that they failed to come to any kind of um, reconciliation. So now it's, now it's headed to court. It's not the first time that Tesla under Elon Musk has been accused of something like this, right? That's right. There, these similar claims have also been pursued by uh, state regulators in California. They filed their own suit, the sort of state equivalent of the EEOC, and um, employees themselves have, have filed claims in state and federal court. Those are in pretrial motions. Uh, we expect at least one of those to go to trial. Um, uh, from from one worker who has already pursued his cases in, in previous trials and is getting a retrial. So uh, multiple uh, court proceedings advancing at the same time, um, all alleging essentially that, that Tesla not only uh, allowed discrimination to go on against black employees, but even retaliated against them, uh, firing them within weeks of telling uh, management about these problems. David Ingram, thank you very much. Coming up here on the show, much more to get to, including more changes potentially coming to Delta's loyalty program. After the airline CEO admitted that a controversial update probably went too far, what it might mean for your next Delta ride. Plus, my officials had to go and perform a wellness check on Britney Spears. That's in our five things. Coming up, one thing you cannot buy in bulk at Costco, why they're selling out of gold bars so quickly. That's coming up in our five things. But first, Delta Airlines tonight kind of returning to the gate, if you will, with the CEO saying the overhaul it just did with its loyalty program probably went a little too far. Delta says too many passengers got to elite status. They couldn't handle so many people asking for things like upgrades and lounge access and good seats. So they decided to raise the bar to make the elite level even more elite. 
The SkyMiles overhaul would have changed your status based not on how many miles you fly, but on how much money you spend. People didn't like that, with some customers promising to take their business elsewhere. This was like a whole big controversy. Even the points guy, you know the points guy, his whole thing is like helping people leverage your points from airlines. He said the changes to what Delta did convinced him to stop actually chasing status. JetBlue, they try to get in on this. They're like, hey, Delta customers, come over to us. We will match your status in our loyalty program. Leslie Josephs is joining us now. So, Leslie, I mean, like, Delta can do whatever it wants here, but it sounds like the CEO is saying, okay, wait a second, like, we will recalibrate a little bit here. Exactly. So this was a couple of weeks ago, and what Delta did is kind of make their frequent flyer program. When you earn that elite status, that's the thing that gives you free upgrades sometimes uh, to a seat that has more legroom, sometimes even to first class or business class if you're at the very, very top tier of elite status, you know, into the access into the lounges. It's going to get harder to earn. They're going to base that only on the amount that you're spending with the airline, spending on credit cards. Before, it was kind of a mix of how much you were flying. So is it a frequent flyer program anymore? I mean, the way that we've seen all the airlines pretty much go, it's, it's how much you're shelling out. And what we're seeing is that airlines are awash in frequent flyers, and they need to make those higher level status as, you know, more appealing. And how do you do that when you have so many people that can earn that status? You have to still make I, it feel special. I kind of love, Leslie, that you're using the phrase frequent flyers because, like, that's not always what it's about for some of these programs. For some of them, it's like, do you have their credit card? And are you spending money? And if you do fly even a few times a year, are you flying first class or coach, right? Like, who, who are these programs better for? People well, who fly, the customers, or the airlines themselves? I think they could almost rebrand at this point and not even call them frequent flyer programs and just call them big spender programs um, because that <laughs> is how you get to elite status. But, you know, Delta is one of it's one of those cases where it's a victim of its own success. You know, so many people were spending big in the pandemic, even when they weren't flying. They racked up a ton of points. They racked up a ton of frequent flyer miles and they were able to reach some of these elite tiers um, that maybe they weren't able to before. Uh, also, Delta had kind of, and other airlines too, you know, they had holdovers over the pandemic. You know, you can hold on to your status for uh, for coming year. They knew people weren't flying. People are traveling again. You know, they're, they're gaining that status. You know, what that means is that the, the lounges and other perks, right. you know, the first class cabins, they're very full. So they have to make sure that those, you know, the, the highest, highest spenders are getting rewarded for their, their good business. Right. The biggest of the big spenders, if you will. Leslie Josephs, thank you very much. Let's You're get welcome. you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the United Auto Workers Union says they will expand their already historic strike by 10 a.m. tomorrow if there's not big progress in negotiations. That's according to somebody familiar with the discussions, talking with our colleagues at CNBC. If the talks don't go as planned, the union president is supposed to host a Facebook Live event to announce which plants would walk out at noon. The spokespeople for the automakers did not respond to our request for comment. Number two, one source telling an NBC News outlet today the police performed a wellness check on Britney Spears. After this, this video of her dancing with knives, fans started to get worried, but Spears says that this whole thing was inspired by Shakira's VMA performance recently, where she also danced with knives. The source says Spears is fine and that this whole thing is overblown. Number three, the Senate passed a new dress code it's a lot like the old dress code. Remember last week, the top Senate Democrats said senators can wear whatever they want. That's after John Fetterman, the senator from PA who you just saw, goes around. Listen, he, guy wears a hoodie to work. He wants to go on the Senate floor and vote. You're not supposed to do that under the dress code rules. Those got changed. Now, for the first time ever, the Senate is like, nope, we will require business attire. Men have to wear a coat, a tie, and pants. No specific requirements for women. Number four, you can now add gold to your Costco shopping list. That's right. Can't buy them in bulk. Sadly, one of the few things you can't at Costco, but they are one of the hottest items there. Costco says they're selling out within hours. Only members can see the price, but people on Reddit say they're going for like 1900 bucks. They're also just being sold online, limited to two per shopper. That's it. Number five, a new study says these mysterious fairy circles, as they're called, which kind of look like polka dots on Earth, might be more common than experts originally thought. Up till now, they thought that these rings in dirt were just in two countries. They might actually be in 15. I just don't know where they're from or how they got created when we come back. New details on search warrants in the University of Idaho murders, what investigators are now looking for in the suspect's shopping history. Plus, later, get ready to start paying your student loan back again very soon, how that restart is adding to recession concerns.
details now coming out in the trial of two Colorado police officers charged in the death of a young black man in Aurora. Prosecutors say excessive force turned the late night stop of Elijah McClain into a deadly encounter. Defense attorneys argue it was McClain's actions, as they say, choosing to resist, in their words, that led to his death, not what the officers did. This is a story, of course, that gained national attention as the Black Lives Matter movement picked up steam in 2020. Aaron Gilchrist has the story with a warning. Some of the video we're about to show you may be disturbing. Please be seated. The court will recall. We're now a week into graphic testimony in the trial over Elijah McClain's death at the hands of police officers in Aurora, Colorado, four years ago. Officer Randy Rodema and former officer Jason Rosenblatt, the first to stand trial, each pleading not guilty to one count of manslaughter and one count of criminally negligent homicide. Next witness for the prosecution. Thank you, Your Honor. This case started with a stop at a convenience store. NBC News obtained video of a 23-year-old McLean buying cans of iced tea on August 24th, 2019 and leaving the store before a call to 911. Yeah. Okay. Were any weapons involved or mentioned? No. Court documents saying that McLean was often cold and wore a runner's mask and jacket even on warmer days. As McLean walked home carrying a plastic bag in one hand, a cell phone in the other, and earphones in his ears, then Officer Nathan Woodyard tried to stop him. Do a favor, stop right there. Hey, stop right there. Stop. 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 I have a right to stop you because you're being suspicious. Well, okay. Turn around. Turn around. Rosenblatt and Rodema arrived on the scene minutes later, and the situation escalated as the officers tried to move McLean, eventually wrestling him to the ground. Get us some more units. We're fighting them. Woodyard put McLean in a neck hold, which was eventually released. An officer described McLean as having, quote, yeah, crazy strength. A paramedic gave McLean ketamine to sedate him before loading him into an ambulance. McLean's heart stopped en route to the hospital. He went into a coma and died three days later. Now, after four years, two of the three officers who responded that night are on trial. Their attorney saying they followed procedure and demonstrated restraint. From the contact to the force to put him in the recovery position was all pursuant to their training and all pursuant to the policy. The prosecution relaying more grim details of McLean's death. When the autopsy is performed, his lungs are twice the weight of a normal person's. And you'll hear that in his lungs... There's digestive material and digestive fluid because he's been inhaling his own vomit. The defense largely blaming McLean's death on the paramedics who administered the ketamine. But then when paramedics arrive on scene, the paramedics have full medical control. The two paramedics have pled not guilty to manslaughter and negligent homicide. They're scheduled for trial in November. A critical care expert suggesting the ketamine was just one factor. Was the ketamine in your opinion, the only thing that caused Mr. McLean's death on the night that he died? In my opinion, it was not. It was also the position that he was put in that reduced his ability to cough. One thing both sides agree on, McLean's death should never have happened. Now his family and friends waiting to see who a jury believes is responsible. Aaron Gilchrist is joining us now. Go back to this uh, piece about the paramedics here and the ketamine, because uh, the coroner at first could not determine exactly how Elijah McClain died. Revised coroner's report said it was from complications from the ketamine after being forcibly restrained. Right. Does what happened with these officers, is there any potential that that could affect the trial of the medics? So the judge separated all the trials. There are five trials that are going to, or five people who are being tried here eventually. And I, I think what you're going to see is, as we, you know, the prosecution believes that all five of them are equally responsible, that they're all guilty of the charges, the things they've been charged with. The defense here made very clear that it's trying to shift the blame to the two paramedics who administered the ketamine. And that is the case that they're trying to make through this trial. So it'll be interesting to see how that fits into the trial of the two paramedics when that starts in November uh, and whether there might be some some sort of cross testimony in, in trying to trying to shift blame in this instance. But again, the prosecution is saying that all five of these people are responsible for Elijah McClain's death and they want them all to be held responsible equally. Aaron Gilchrist, thank you very much for staying on top of the story for us. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. 
Out of our Western Bureau, police are looking into whether the University of Idaho murders suspect purchased any knives online. Did he buy knives off the Internet? According to some newly unsealed court documents, they've put in place multiple search warrants for places like Amazon and PayPal. The suspect here, Brian Koberger, is accused of murdering Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan, Zana Cronodal, and Kaylee Gonsalves last November. Officials are still looking for the murder weapon. Out of our Northeast Bureau, officials in New York City say they will boost safety procedures at daycares there after multiple ghost guns and a 3D printer were found in an unlocked room at a licensed daycare center. Officials say three people have been arrested. It comes less than two weeks after a child died from apparent opioid exposure at another daycare in the city. Out of our Southeastern Bureau, American soldier Travis King, of course, that army private who crossed into North Korea a couple months ago, he is back in the United States today. Officials say he's very happy to be home, at least on his way home. For now, he's been evaluated at a medical center in Texas. Remember, King was detained in North Korea in July after he ran across the border on a tour of the demilitarized zone. Coming up, an alarming new report that says teens are getting targeted on TikTok, quote unquote, steroid talk. We'll talk about the dangers of that and what some of these researchers want Congress to do next. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, starting Sunday, starting Sunday, guess what? you got to start repaying your student loans. Tens of millions of people will have to pay up off what they borrowed. But some experts think that could slow down spending, maybe even enough to drive the economy into a recession. That's the concern. NBC's Maura Barrett has more. Borrowers around the country know what October 1st means. Student loan repayments resume after a three-year pause. More than 40 million borrowers owe student debt, now totaling more than $1.7 trillion in the U.S. Experts estimate borrowers will start repaying an average of about $350 a month. That's significant and could leave a huge dent in monthly budgets. A recent report from Credit Karma found that more than half of federal student loan borrowers say they'll have to choose between repayments and necessities, limiting consumer spending, which has been a pillar in keeping the economy chugging along. So could a hit to that spending trigger a recession? I think that we'll see the first signs of this after the uh... The student loan forgiveness program ends. This is going to be a consumer-led recession. I think will ultimately be more severe than people think into 2024. Others see student loans as a small part of the economy. Student financial aid expert Mark Kantrowitz puts it at 0.4% of GDP. He thinks the return of repayments will have little impact. It's a really tiny portion of the economy. It's not going to derail the economy. But people might think twice about those big-ticket items. People have said that student loan payments have a domino effect, that they cause delays in people buying their first homes or their first cars or getting married. Um, and that is true. And while October 1st is seen as a hard deadline, its effects may be more gradual. The Biden administration is offering income-based repayment plans to those who might have had a tough time starting up payments again. And they could also get some relief when it comes to their credit scores. We know many of our borrowers are gonna struggle to make payments. Um, but we want to make sure that we're not sending their name to credit agencies. So we're going to hold them harmless for a year as they're getting back up. Amid a looming government shutdown, it's important to know even with federal loans, interest will accrue and payments are still due either way. Maura Barrett, NBC News. All right, thanks to Maura Barrett for that reporting. A new report out tonight is sounding the alarm on so-called steroid talk, calling on Congress to do more to stop younger people from seeing these videos on TikTok promoting things like steroids. They want action here. This tech watchdog group says that people between the ages of 18 and 24 saw videos having to do with steroids and similar kinds of drugs something like 420 million times in the last few years. That may even be an undercount since there's no data on people under the age of 18. These are videos that are often encouraging, like, for example, male teenagers to take steroids, showing bodybuilders with the hashtag roids. Others are captioned things like risk it, showing people with handfuls of drugs. One user even suggests that others tell parents that the steroids are vitamins. This report says lawmakers have got to figure out how these sites are selling substances like these in the first place. I want to bring in Dr. Natalie Azar for more on this. Talk through like the risks of steroids and the way that this report, uh, it seems, is making the link between these videos being out there and then, of course, um, the promotion of the sales of those to people who are younger. 
Just another thing for us parents to worry about, right, Hallie? Yeah. So, look, the risk of taking anabolic steroids are numerous for both boys and for girls. We're talking about things like fertility issues, impotence, um, mood changes, aggression, heart, liver problems. And just as a little aside to parents out there, some of the first symptoms that you might notice that could clue you into your child using this are, in fact, the mood swings as well as acne. So keep an eye out for that. In terms of how these sellers are getting their hands on it, well, you know there's a black market for everything. It shouldn't be that way. The FDA has classified anabolic steroid as a scheduled three controlled substance, which means it requires a prescription as well as some other sort of regulatory things in order to prescribe. But just like other things, Hallie, people can falsely advertise. They could say it's a vitamin and it actually contains anabolic steroids. Some of this stuff is coming from outside of the U.S. Really, really, really hard to regulate. There's a TikTok spokesperson who tells us this report isn't differentiating between what content is positive and what content is negative associated with the hashtags. When we talk about platforms um, like TikTok, I mean, listen, all these social media platforms, there's been a lot of conversation around young women with body image issues. I wonder if there also should be, and if this report is highlighting the need for conversations around young men with body image issues as well. It should. And, you know, I always feel like we sometimes do these these um, segments together, Hallie. I have a 15-year-old daughter and an 18-year-old son. Both of them are affected by, by what they see on social media. And we can't ignore that boys are also getting these messages and, and seeing these images and, you know, are trying to be just as attractive as, as girls are trying to be. And I think it's a reminder to all of us as parents to really keep an eye out on what our kids are doing on social media. Ask them what social media platforms they're using, how many hours a day they're on it, and really be a part of the conversation with your kids. That's the best way that you can protect them. Dr. Natalie Azar, so glad to have you on here. Uh, your expertise, both professional and personal, really appreciate it. Still to come here on the show. Something Netflix started, now ending. We're rolling back the clock on their famous red envelopes. Here's a pop quiz. Do you know what the very first DVD Netflix ever sent was? I'll tell you in just a sec. We are a long way from Beetlejuice, the very first DVD Netflix ever tucked into a little red envelope. Because tomorrow, 25 years after that first shipment, Netflix will send out its last, a nostalgic milestone for a company that's been disrupting movie watching for a generation. Here's Noah Pransky. Dearly beloved, we gather today to pay tribute to the red envelope that changed the world. At just 25 years young, the Netflix DVD service is going dark, leaving behind a legacy of innovation that truly shaped a generation. Remember when we used to get those in the mail, the red envelope DVDs? There's something special about getting a package in the yeah. mail. In an era where Netflix is known as the world's dominant streaming service, with more than 238 million subscribers, You'd be forgiven if you didn't realize the company was still shipping out DVDs. Flashback to the 90s where watching a movie at home usually required a trip to your local blockbuster. But then in 1998, Netflix blew up that business model by providing movies on demand through the U.S. Postal Service. This is a DVD service. Mm -hmm. So you get for 20 bucks a month, you get three DVDs. So you can have them come into your house and you can get some great family movies. In 2000, Netflix launched the first algorithm to recommend movies based on previous selections. A year later, it reached a million subscribers. And in 2007, as it was reaching its one billionth disc shipped, Netflix introduced another innovation. DVD rental giant Netflix today is launching a new service that lets subscribers watch movies on their computers. A streaming giant was born. Blockbuster goes out of business. And then another major market disruption as Netflix expands into content creation with hit shows like Orange is the New Black and House of Cards. I binge watched until 2 a.m. A child of the dot-com era was now going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the granddaddies of both movies and television. Television, but all the while still sending those DVDs to the homes of millions of Americans. I didn't even know that was still a thing. It's still a thing. <laughs> Until this week. It's just weird thinking about how it's something you'll tell your kids and your grandkids about and they'll think you're just a dinosaur. As a thank you to loyal subscribers, Netflix offered a final shipment of up to 10 free DVDs for customers to keep. A bitter week for some, okay. 
sweet for others. That is amazing. I worked for Blockbuster as a store manager back in the day. Why are you so happy about the end of the DVD? Because they put Blockbuster and me out of business. The red DVD envelope is survived by streaming giant Netflix and millions of empty mailboxes across the United States. I'm going to be honest, no, I didn't even know they were still doing the red envelopes. You know what I mean? Like, that is that is early, millennial, late 90s, I mean, all of the above. But what's so interesting is the way that Netflix is still so relevant to all of us today, right? It's not like eight tracks, if people even know what that is, like, where it's just totally a down. Netflix is still around. People still watch shows on Netflix, even with Netflix's business model starting to change Post disruption, its stock yeah. is down. They're making people, you know, cut back on sharing accounts with the password sharing, et cetera. Where does this company go? So they've really shifted in the last few years from a company focused on growth to a company focused on profits. And their stock about two years ago took a huge dive, but they've actually rebounded pretty nicely over the last 15 months or so. And even during the writer's strike, They've done pretty well, a lot better than a lot of other content creating companies. They've found a way to reinvent themselves. They've done this time and time again. And to your point, they're still around 25 years later. So I would not expect the end of the DVD mail-in service to do much to their stock price now. Allie. Our Gen Z streamer, as old as our Gen Z colleagues. Noah Pransky, thank you so much. Sure. Appreciate it. That's a wrap for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. careening toward a crisis in the Capitol with just over 48 hours until the government shuts down. With that countdown, the backdrop to a fiery first step toward possibly impeaching President Biden with Republican star witness not exactly delivering. So what's next for Congress, for the president, for those government workers, for our economy? We're live on the Hill in just a minute. Plus, over in Philadelphia, locals are bracing for the potential of a third straight night of looting and vandalizing. How the city hopes to put a stop to this chaos. And way more questions than answers coming out of a hearing on those deadly Maui wildfires. Why it could take more than a year to get to the bottom of how those fires started in the first place. Plus, oil prices today close to the highest they've been in more than a year. What it means for gassing up and turning on the heat with winter right around the corner. Plus, backpedaling from the CEO of Delta tonight. Why he says changes to the airline's loyalty program probably went too far. If you're an elite or hope to be an elite member, stay tuned. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And right now, Congress is up against the clock. They are up against it, running out of time with just over 48 hours to go to try to avoid a big government shutdown. If it happens, it could mean problems for millions and millions of us inside the Beltway and certainly outside the Beltway, too. And at this point, all signs point to a shutdown right around the corner here. There's this big fight right over whether or not House Republicans can get to some kind of a deal. We don't know what that deal would look like. There are no contours of a deal that are coming into effect. There are no, you know, tiptoeing members getting closer to a deal before this shutdown is set to happen. 11.59 p.m. Saturday, right over, ticking over to midnight Sunday. This is the backdrop, right? This very real drama to a very different drama, because in the last couple of hours, we've seen the House's first impeachment inquiry against President Biden wrapping up on Capitol Hill, with Democrats raising questions about whether it should be happening at all, especially right now. There were fireworks, we saw. There were surprises in this Republican-led investigation that's essentially trying to link President Biden to business dealings related to his son, Hunter. Republicans suggest that there was some sort of wrongdoing, but they have presented no evidence to support that. And the big takeaway here tonight, the star witnesses that Republicans called to testify, some of them are pointing that out, that they're not sure there's even enough evidence to move forward here. Look. I do not believe that the current evidence would support articles of impeachment. That is something that an inquiry has to establish. I am not here today to even suggest that there was corruption, fraud, or any wrongdoing. In my opinion, more information needs to be gathered and assessed before I would make such an assessment. I want to bring in our Capitol Hill correspondent, Ryan Nobles, who has watched every minute of both of these big stories that are connected, Ryan. <laughs> there is a nexus between them. But let me start, focus more on the shutdown piece of it. It feels like the question I should be asking you is not, is there going to be a shutdown? It's how long is a shutdown going to last? 
Uh, you're 100% right to ask that question, Hallie, because I think that there are very few people up here on Capitol Hill that believe that there's going to be some sort of miracle that's going to take place between now and midnight on Saturday that would allow the government to continue to stay open. Right now, the two sides don't even really appear to be talking, and you essentially have two different trains moving on parallel tracks that at no point intend to intersect, and, and that means that government workers across the country need to brace for that. I mean, there's a real possibility that many of these government workers are going to leave work uh, in Washington, in uh, cities all across the country uh, on Friday afternoon and not know whether or not they're even going to be able to come back to work on Monday. So uh, there really is no progress. The Senate uh, may pass their own version of a spending plan uh, this weekend, but that's something the House is in not necessarily interested in taking up. So right now it's still a staring contest, Hallie, and ultimately the American people are going to be the ones who are the victims of this. We talk about the shutdown, that, that countdown clock. It was a very literal countdown clock, and it looked like iPad form sitting there at this first impeachment inquiry today mm -hmm. that House Republicans are bringing against President Biden here. You saw Democrats point out every minute that this shutdown was getting closer. The White House, every hour, was sending out updates, 53 mm -hmm. hours, 54, 50, however far away the shutdown was. House Republicans, we heard from them, suggesting that this was too important in their view, the concern that they had about President Biden, to wait any longer. Talk us through um, your key takeaways here from what could be the first step toward maybe impeaching the president. Well, I think, Hallie, you have to look at this in the frame of what the Republicans hoped to present today. Uh, they have felt for a long time that the American people, writ large, and they would blame those of us in the mainstream media, as they would describe it, as not paying close enough attention to mm. the information that they've collected in their investigation in, into the Biden family. And so what they hoped today was going to be an opportunity for them to lay that all on the table and, and point to what they would describe a, as a culture of corruption that extends all the way back to the president himself. I think by any measure, they failed to do that. Uh, the, the impeachment was rocky at times. It was all over the place. Uh, they had the, their own witnesses who they brought to try and, and, and double down on their opinion of this, uh, kind of uh, uh, contradict many of those claims. And listen to what the chairman himself said about how this hearing went today. This isn't an impeachment hearing. I've never said impeachment. People ask, would you vote to impeach? I would vote to impeach. My job is to determine how much money the Biden's got, and I think I'm doing a good job with that. I think this committee's doing a good job with that. So they did talk a lot about all the money that the Biden family uh, has uh, made over the past couple of years. Uh, that isn't necessarily a crime, and it's certainly not a crime that implicates the president himself. And so uh, it does appear, at least based on this debut, that they've got a long way to go before they can even be in the ballpark of getting 218 in votes for articles of impeachment, Hallie. Worth noting that what's happening behind you there in that building, it, it, that's not a court of law, right? These are not court proceedings here. They are, of course, mm -hmm. um, proceedings in the court of public opinion, if you will. And at this early juncture, we know that our latest NBC News polling shows that most Americans, more than half of Americans, oppose these hearings. Now, that breaks down along party lines, as you might expect. What's interesting is when you look mm -hmm. at the, the breakout for independent voters, something like 60% of those independent voters also oppose these impeachment hearings moving forward. Talk through the political risk-reward calculation and what's next for Republicans. Yeah, I think those numbers are really important, Hallie, because when you show those numbers, more than 50 percent of Americans do not believe that this impeachment inquiry is a good idea. That's actually significantly higher than Joe Biden's approval rating. So what that tells you uh, that there are 56 percent of Americans who don't think this is a good idea, but there's only about 37 percent of Americans who think that Joe Biden's doing a good job. So there's a 20 percent gap there of people who aren't necessarily fans of President Biden, but also don't think that this impeachment inquiry is a good idea. So there is political risk for this on both sides. We've seen in the past impeachment inquiries kind of blow up in the face of the parties that are presenting them. Think back to Bill Clinton. His uh, popularity actually went up uh, during his impeachment, uh, the things that he was dealing with uh, in the 90s. So uh, we're a long way away from being able to determine how this is going to impact President Biden. But it's certainly something to keep in the back of your mind. Ryan Nobles, uh, moving your cot, I am sure, into the Senate side of the chamber there. I appreciate it, Ryan. Lots to cover over the next few days. Thanks. We are learning now some new details out of Baltimore about the hours before a young tech CEO was allegedly brutally murdered in her home in Baltimore. Charging documents into us late today say security camera footage showed Pavel LaPere getting home late last Friday, sitting on her apartment lobby couch before the suspect, now under arrest in the case, Jason Billingsley, apparently 
waves from outside. These documents, as you can see here, these documents say that LaPere goes to the door, opens it, lets him in. Police say the two of them are then seen on video riding the elevator together. Billingsley is later seen leaving the building alone. It wasn't until three days later on Monday that LaPere's body was found on her roof. Police say a brick, blood, buttons, teeth, and some clothes were found at the crime scene as well. We're also just learning the police have been monitoring apparently, Billingsley, for days. They even had a warrant out for his arrest before this death of Pavel LaPere for allegedly raping a woman days earlier. Billingsley is now in police custody. He was captured at a train station something like 30 miles away from Baltimore, with police acknowledging that even his capture is small consolation for the people who loved Pavel LaPere. I know this arrest does not bring back Pavel LaPere or take away the heels of the many victims of Mr. Billingsley. We're going to put this individual, this violent criminal offender, repeat offender, back in jail where he belongs. I'm going to bring in Ron Allen, who is live for us in Baltimore. Ron, what else are we learning tonight from these charging documents from police? Well, one thing we're not learning, Hallie, is why this happened. The police still say that there were no apparently previous connections between LaPere and Billingsley. And why he was at the building where she lived and worked and why uh, she let him in uh, that night around 11 o'clock or so is still a, a mystery. Uh, but, yes, the charging documents that we've seen today are really uh, detail a very horrific crime. And, uh, and it leaves a lot of unanswered questions, though, about, again, why this happened, what the motive was. And, and that's going forward is what a lot of people still want to know. There's been a huge outpouring of grief for... LaPere in this community. We attended a, uh, a vigil last night where there are hundreds of people uh, gathered, mourning, grieving, and still, uh, again, a lot of unanswered questions as to exactly why this happened. What about these questions about police accountability here? Because apparently Billingsley had been under surveillance. What do we know about how that unfolded? Yes, he'd been under surveillance because he was wanted in connection with a alleged crime that involved a home invasion, a alleged arson, attempted murder, or rape involving a couple that he apparently targeted for some criminal reason, police said. They wouldn't reveal exactly what was going on there. But because they saw that as a targeted crime, the police did not raise alarms in the public about this. Uh, therefore, when Billingsley allegedly killed LaPere a few days after that, um, there was no warning to the public. He wasn't being, the public wasn't aware to look out for him. And that's what a lot of people are concerned about, that there should have been that. So the bottom line now is that officials are saying that they're going to try and put him away for the rest of his life. Here's the Baltimore State's attorney today. Take a listen. Our hope and goal is if this individual is found guilty in a court of law, that this individual will never get out to see the light of day again and to ever hurt any of the citizens of our fine city ever again. We also know, of course, that he had been released on parole, privation back in October of last year. Uh, that's something that was according to the law, but again, raising a lot of questions about how that could happen, how someone who committed such violent sexual acts could be released early. He was essentially, ser he essentially served about half of a 14-year sentence, but then was released on supervised, uh, uh, supervised, uh, uh, supervised way. Uh, but again, after serving seven years of a 14-year sentence. Allie. Ron Allen, live for us in Baltimore. Ron, thank you for being there. To Philadelphia now, where the city is bracing for the potential, although they hope not the reality, of night three, perhaps, of looting and vandalism after night two rocked the city just about 12, 18 hours ago. Look at this video here, just into NBC News. You see a group of people kick down or, like, punch in or do something to get through that door. You saw the glass break. They come in. It's a beauty supply store. They're grabbing as much as they can carry and then taking the stuff that they stole back out. Police there are now counting eight more burglaries in the last 24 hours and six more arrests. This is only a day after that first wave of violent break-ins in the city with the aftermath of that here. A bunch of stores vandalized, some totally cleared out of stuff. Local officials are now putting at least some of the blame on one popular influencer online, saying that she encouraged others by live-streaming all the chaos as it was going down and, in their words, inciting a riot. You see her here, Deja Blackwell. She's more commonly known as Meatball online. Talking with one of our affiliates in just the last 90 minutes or so. Watch. I just prefer, you know, 
Never loot again, stay out of trouble, and never go to jail. George Solis is joining us now live from Philadelphia. So any indications, George, that we are headed to perhaps yet another night of what you could call chaos, burglary, theft in Philadelphia? What's the city doing here to try to get a handle on this? Well, I can tell you, Hallie, businesses and a lot of people here in Philadelphia hopefully don't want to see another night three right. of this. Philadelphia police are in full force. They are monitoring stores, they're monitoring social media as a result of the two nights of looting they saw. More than 50 arrests have happened, a lot of them adults, including that social media influencer that you referenced there who they say incited this. And she's in charge with six felony counts and two misdemeanors as a result of this. She made bail. She is now home. And as you heard in that clip, somewhat remorseful, although she's still been on social media today, live streaming, talking about the arrest, talking about her involvement in some of this alleged uh, rioting that happened here in the city of Philadelphia. But again, we can't forget this is also about the business owners who are impacted. A lot of these people that were hurt and hit were small businesses in this community who have built their businesses from the ground up. And they are absolutely devastated that people within their own community would come in and break windows and steal all of their belongings. I had a very emotional exchange with the business owner of that beauty supply store. Take a listen to their words and how hurt she is. You can just hear it in her voice. I've been working for over three years to save, to open, to get this open for over three years. I work overnight, days, six, seven days a week, so I could get this to here. And this is what happened. Now, Hallie, despite that all, she is still open for business. Her business is all boarded up, but she says she wants to show that she's not afraid, and she naturally is that this might happen again. But she is going to keep moving forward, Hallie. Talk to us about this influencer, because it appears that she is obviously out after being arrested. And more broadly here, about the economic impact of something like this on a city like Philadelphia or others. Yeah, as I mentioned, she made bail, so she's home right now. We tried to interview her ourselves, but her mother insisted that she do speak to us. But obviously, she was posting on social media. And some of the charges that uh, Ms. Blackwell, a.k.a. Meatball, faces, you're looking, I mentioned criminal conspiracy, criminal mischief and rioting and disorderly conduct, Hallie. And some of the impacts of this as well, I think it's pretty obvious when you have these businesses that are shut right. down, well, obviously you have empty storefronts, you have people that don't uh, can't go to these stores, and then you have uh, less traffic in some of these areas. So obviously it has a big ripple effect in communities, especially like Philadelphia that were hit hard during the pandemic. And they also saw rioting like this uh, two years ago during the George Floyd unrest and the uh, Walter Waller unrest where there was a lot more rampant rioting. But again, Philadelphia police saying they are going to be out here in full force to ensure we do not see a three-peat of some of the rioting we have seen over the past two days, Hallie. They for sure do not want to see that. George Solis, thank you for being there. Oil prices starting to tick down a bit today after hitting their highest levels in more than a year. With concern now from some experts, they could stay that way. They could stay high for the next few months. So now what does that mean for you and the price you pay? Well, let's see. Sort of people just hoping it doesn't trickle down, costing us more for gas or for... Heating for our homes as the weather gets colder. CNBC senior analyst and commentator Ron Insana is joining us now. Good to have you as always, Ron. Super plain Thanks, English here. What does it mean for people like you and me when these oil prices are high like this? What should we expect for the next few months? Is it going to cost me more to get gas? Yep, it certainly is. Certain, uh, we're likely to see $4 gasoline with oil above hmm. $90 a barrel. OPEC and Russia have cut production by over a million barrels a day, even though the U.S., is pumping near record levels of crude oil, we're going to see prices move up because as long as oil's above $90 a barrel, we're still making an adjustment towards higher gasoline prices for sure. What about home heating oil, if somebody uses that for uh, the home? Because I'm looking at winter so, coming up, that could be a concern. Yeah, it depends how you heat your home. If you're using heating oil, which is a derivative of crude oil, it's absolutely going to go up to some extent. Natural gas is rather abundant in the United States, and the price is relatively well contained. So that will make the difference in your monthly heating and or cooling bill, depending on where you live in the country. But we are seeing tightness, as, as you mentioned rightly, in, in, in crude oil supplies. That affects heating oil more directly. And so, again, really depends what you use. And it also is going to really depend on, on how the winter shakes out. If it's colder than uh, normal, that will put upward pressure on prices as well. I love when you th say things around like tightness in crude oil supplies. From a supply and <laughs> demand perspective, like where are we? 
Well, you know, we have a drawdown in inventories of crude oil in the United States. We're at the lowest level, really, that we've seen in quite a number of decades. Uh, last year, the Biden administration, you know, sold uh, oil from what's called the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in order to combat high prices after the invasion of Ukraine. And now they can't do that again. And so we're at the mercy of OPEC to a large extent. Even though we're producing more oil, these production cuts that OPEC has undertaken has really put a dent in the in the price, knocked it towards ninety dollars plus here in the U.S. and almost a hundred dollars in Europe. Ron and Sana, thank you very much. We'll be watching to see what this means for all of our budgets and wallets tonight. We are learning it could be something like a year and a half before we get any answers, if we ever do, from Maui's electric company on what role it could have played in those devastating wildfires. Listen to what we heard from one official at a congressional hearing today are willing to commit to make those results public once the investigation is completed. I think it's too early to speculate on exactly what comes out of this and what form it comes out, but we are committed to sharing what's critical uh, with the public on this. Is there any reason why you wouldn't make it public? I mean, I, you seem to be hesitating a little bit. I think it's just too early to speculate. Hawaiian Electric is facing multiple lawsuits claiming its power lines started the wildfire in Maui early last month, the firestorm that, as you know, killed almost 100 people and incinerated 2,000 buildings. Now, the power company says its power lines had been de-energized for hours before a second fire started. That second fire is the one that did all this. Everything you're looking at here basically burnt Lahaina down to the ground, Lahaina, the town there on Maui. The cause of the fire has not been determined. I want to bring in Dana Griffin, who's got more on this. So it feels like the takeaway here from some of this very highly anticipated testimony in front of members of Congress is we are going to have to wait for any answers here. Yeah, a lot more questions than answers that came that came from that hearing today, Hallie. No major bombshells, but the Hawaiian Electric CEO once again admitted that it was their power line, the down power line, that started the early fire. We learned that that fire grew to three acres. It was put out according to Hawaiian Electric. And as you mentioned, their power lines were de-energized during those several hours before that second fire. Now, that fire has not been determined, but this investigation will hopefully uncover more answers and possibly the reason why they don't want to commit to putting out that full report at this time is because they don't know what they're going to find. And, you know, Hawaiian Electric is facing litigation. So while they want to get to the bottom of this, they also may try to protect themselves or at least make sure they're protected from uh, this report causing more harm. Uh, the CEO was also grilled over why they did not shut off power before those high wind gusts kicked in. They were warned about it days before. And the CEO said that that was not part of their protocol. There were also discussions about de about grounding power lines in the future. That's the process of putting those power lines underground so that high winds cannot spark fires. And officials said that that's possible, but it is very costly, and that cost will have to be passed on to customers. Hallie? The, the underlying piece of all of this here, Dana, like the thing that is so foundational to this is this issue of accountability. And that is what is so critical for the people who, in just the last couple of days, have finally been able to get back to what used to be their homes in, in and around Lahaina to see what happened, to witness for themselves this destruction here. And it feels like that has been a uh, a running theme in this ever since these fires first started is accountability for the people affected. Yeah, and they want answers as they're returning home. They want to know what caused this destructive fire. People have lost homes. They've lost loved ones. There are still people who are missing and remains that have yet to be identified. Uh, a couple of people have already spoken about what this experience has been like returning home. Listen. It's pretty bad. <laughs> After so many years living here, I just can't say it. And I think you really need to just see, we need to see it in person. We need to go and stand on our property. So the committee members asked Hawaiian Electric and some of the Hawaii regulators to provide the information to some of the questions that they did not get answered today. They're expected to provide that information in the next 10 days. Hallie. Dana Griffin, thank you. New details tonight from here in Washington from inside a pretty tense meeting with an indicted sitting senator insisting to a room full of colleagues who don't want him there, he's sticking around. 
This is according to sources in the room. New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez defiant at that lunch with fellow Democrats. With one senator who was there, again, behind closed doors, telling NBC News, Menendez said, and I'm quoting here, I'm not going to give you my defense. I'm going to defend myself. I'm not resigning. It's not exactly what at least 30 of his colleagues wanted to hear. Everybody you're seeing on your screen who have all come out and said they believe Menendez should step down. This is after his indictment on federal bribery charges. On that list, one of those people you see, Pennsylvania Democratic Senator John Fetterman. He didn't even bother going to this meeting today. He came out and said, hey, there's really no point. Watch. I didn't go to the lunch. I refused to because the only thing that if he has something to say, it's like, you know, he's resigning. That's the only honorable exit, excuse me, exit. And he's got to go. He's got to go. I can't imagine, you know, how he could possibly explain any of that kind of a thing. Menendez has insisted he did nothing wrong and he will not leave. Listen to what he told our team. So continue to cast votes on behalf of the people of New Jersey as I have for 18 years. And I'm sure when they need those votes, they'll be looking forward for me to cast those votes. Uh, Ali Vitale is following this one for us tonight. A bit of a pragmatic line from Senator Menendez there, basically saying, you know, essentially the margins yeah. are so slim that uh, Democrats are going to want that vote. Now, the question tonight seems to be, in my view, what is the top Senate Democrat going to do about this? Because 24 hours ago on this show, we talked about how Chuck Schumer indicated he wanted to hear from Senator Menendez. He was waiting to see what the senator was going to say at this meeting. So where is Chuck Schumer on this? He's the leader of the conference, uh, and his, obviously, sort of opinion, his thoughts on this are going to matter. And that's going to be our next question tomorrow when we see the Senate majority leader, because he did leave the door open to what he would do, didn't decide either way when he was asked earlier this week. Now that he's heard from Menendez, though, there is an open question about how Schumer will react, especially when you consider not just that 30 of his Democratic colleagues have said that they want Menendez to resign, but also because when you hear about the tone and the tenor of what happened in that room, it sounds like senators listened but their minds weren't exactly changed. Listen to Tim Kaine about what that was like. Senator Menendez addressed us. Um, there, there wasn't Q&A or anything like that, but I'm, I, I don't really want to talk about it yet. Do you feel like he should resign? Um, I've answered that question already. Uh, the charges are disqualifying if true, but anybody who is facing a charge uh, in our system gets to contest the charge. So you can even see there, Senator Kane reluctant to say too much about what it was like in there. But it's clear that Menendez's defiant posture publicly is what he's also bringing into these private spaces with his Senate colleagues. To be clear, all of the Democratic senators could call on Senator Menendez to resign. And he doesn't have to. He can stay. He got voted exactly. in. Unless they move to expel him, which seems highly unlikely at this point, he could just hang out. But what is that life like? In other words, if you are in some ways a pariah among at least some of your fellow Democratic colleagues, can you be effective, Ali? Well, caucus lunch is certainly going to be awkward if this one was any indication, Hallie. But there's actually, although these cases are different, something instructive about the case of Congressman George Santos, who continues to be a part of the Republican conference on the House side, despite the fact that he's under indictment, despite the fact that several of his colleagues have said he should resign, and despite the fact that he's still here awaiting whatever the legal world brings him. That could be an existence that's akin to Menendez's. Of course, what's different is the fact that Santos was a freshman. He really had no friends or close ties up here when he came into the building with all of his controversy. For Menendez, this is someone who has served for decades, is close with many of the people who are now calling on him to resign. And that's where things get a little bit more awkward. What Menendez says in that brief moment as he's running through the halls, where he says, they're going to look for my vote, it's a reality check, but it's also somewhat of a warning. The reality is, even if Menendez weren't in this seat, the New Jersey governor is a Democrat and would still appoint a Democrat. That seat is not going to change hands. The balance of power is not going to change. But Menendez is saying he could make things difficult for his colleagues if they make this difficult for him. Ali Vitale, uh, lots of moving pieces for you on Capitol Hill. Thank you very much for being with us. To some breaking news, right as we were coming on the air earlier tonight, Tesla is now being sued 
for allegedly tolerating racial harassment of its black workers and retaliating against those who spoke out about it. This is a suit brought by the EEOC. You've probably seen their signs up at your work, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And it includes claims from a black worker at the Fremont plant in California who says people were using the N-word all the time, especially men and particularly white men. The suit claims Tesla failed and refused to take steps to address the behavior. Tesla did not immediately respond to CNBC's request for comment. I want to bring in tech reporter David Ingram. What else do we know about this? Ali, this uh, lawsuit filed today goes into great detail about some of what black workers at Tesla's factory here in California said that they faced on a regular basis. Uh, this one worker is quoted in the complaint saying that when he would uh, take breaks and go to the restroom or the break room, that he would see uh, the N-word and other um, racial epithets um, uh, scrawled all over uh, the walls, um, saying, saying that he would see uh, the swastika, the N-word. He said it was so gross and racist, I don't want to talk about it. It would say, kill black people. Now, uh, the EEOC says this has been going on for more than eight years at the Fremont factory, which is about an hour east of here in California. I'm in, I'm in San Francisco. And um, uh, the, Tesla actually has known that this suit was coming for more than a year. They had been in discussions with the EEOC. The EEOC says that they failed to come to any kind of um, reconciliation, so now it's, now it's headed to court. It's not the first time that Tesla under Elon Musk has been accused of something like this, right? That's right. There, these similar claims have also been pursued by, by uh, state regulators in California. They filed their own suit, the sort of state equivalent of the EEOC, and um, employees themselves have, have filed claims in state and federal court. Those are in pretrial motions. Uh, we expect at least one of those to go to trial um, uh, from, from one worker who has already pursued his cases in, in previous trials and is getting a retrial. So uh, multiple uh, court proceedings advancing at the same time, um, all alleging essentially that, that Tesla not only uh, allowed discrimination to go on against black employees, but even retaliated against them, uh, firing them within weeks of telling uh, management about these problems. David Ingram, thank you very much. Lots more to get to here on the show tonight, including some new warnings after officials in one state reported the season's first flu-related death. We'll tell you where and why it's significant. Plus, thousands of people find it out today if they've qualified for the Boston Marathon. And this year, it's harder than ever. We'll tell you why. Delta Airlines tonight kind of returning to the gate, if you will, with the CEO backpedaling saying the overhaul it just went through, this whole controversial thing with Delta loyalty program probably went a little too far. Delta says too many passengers ended up getting elite status. They couldn't handle so many people asking for, like, upgrades and lounge access and nicer seats. So Delta, a couple weeks ago, decided to raise the bar to make the elite level even more elite. This would have changed your status for Sky Miles based not on how many miles you fly, but on how much money you spend. Well... Cue the controversy, because some customers were very ticked off about it. They were like, well, I'm going to take my business elsewhere. Even the points guy, whose whole business is predicated on helping you manage your loyalty points, said what Delta did convinced him to try to stop chasing status. He found it liberating. JetBlue, a competitor, even tried to get in on this. They're looking to poach Delta customers. They offered to match status from Delta to JetBlue in their loyalty program for all this. Leslie Josephs is joining us now. And Leslie, it seems like the head of Delta got the message loud and clear from customers. They didn't like it. They didn't want their Sky Miles messed with. Uh, and now the unwinding begins. Yeah, unfortunately, their Sky Miles will still be messed with, most likely. But Delta CEO Ed Bastian earlier this week did say that there are going to be some changes to their changes. And what Delta did is essentially make it based on spending. That's how you get your elite status. That's probably not going away. But there were some very heavy-handed measures that Delta took. Um, they're going to limit the access to their lounges. It used to be some unlimited... Uh, trips to the lounge um, every year if you have one of these very expensive uh, Amex cards or, or some other kind of co-branded card with Delta. Those are going to be limited. So they might walk back some of those other things. But the way that airlines have been going, you know, United and American are not much different. It is based on how much you spend on the airline, not on how many miles you fly. That's a good point. Leslie Josephs over at CNBC. Good to see you. Thanks.
Let's like get it. you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number two, health officials in South Carolina confirmed the first flu-related death this season. No word on the age or gender of this person. The CDC recommends everybody ages six months or older get a flu shot. Number three, the Senate just passed a new dress code, kind of the old new dress code again. Remember, there's been some flip-flopping on this whole thing. Last week, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said senators can wear whatever they want to go vote on the Senate floor. That mattered for this guy, John Fetterman from Pennsylvania, who likes to rock a hoodie pretty much on the reg. There's some criticism to this, so now the Senate's going to say, nope, it's business attire. For the first time ever, you got to be in a coat, a tie, and pants if you're a man. There are no specific requirements for women. Number four, people are starting to find out if they've qualified for the next Boston Marathon. And brace yourself for some disappointment if you're one of those folks. It's the strictest cutoff time yet to get in. People needed times five and a half minutes faster than the standard qualifier for their respective age, group, and gender. The Boston Athletic Association says something like 22,000 people have been or are in the process of getting accepted. So good luck. Number five, sources confirmed to NBC News that Taylor Swift does indeed plan to go to the Kansas City Chiefs game against the New York Jets on Sunday. No word from Swift's reps on this. She kind of broke the internet when she went to the Chiefs game earlier this week to cheer on Travis Kelsey, this player, this superstar she's rumored to be linked with romantically. People have been apparently responding to earlier rumors about her next appearance already. Online marketplace TickPick says prices for the game jumped to $119 from $80. The swift effect in full effect, perhaps, when we come back. More to get to here on the show in the global, including thousands of people in Greece dealing with their second big storm in less than a month. Take you there. Plus, one wine collection setting a record at auction. If you're wondering why, stand by. New details now coming out in the high-profile trial of two Colorado police officers charged in the death of a young black man in Aurora. You may remember this case, the late-night stop of Elijah McClain that turned into a deadly encounter. It happened in 2019, but gained more attention the next year after the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. The officers were indicted the year after that, with prosecutors saying excessive force is what killed McClain, but defense attorneys argue it was McClain's actions, as they say, choosing to resist, that led to his death. Aaron Gilchrist has the story with a warning. Some of the video you're about to see is disturbing. Please be seated. The court will recall. We're now a week into graphic testimony in the trial over Elijah McClain's death at the hands of police officers in Aurora, Colorado, four years ago. Officer Randy Rodema and former officer Jason Rosenblatt, the first to stand trial, each pleading not guilty to one count of manslaughter and one count of criminally negligent homicide. Next witness for the prosecution. Thank you, Your Honor. This case started with a stop at a convenience store. NBC News obtained video of a 23-year-old McClain buying cans of iced tea on August. August 24th, 2019, and leaving the store before a call to 911. Okay. Okay. Were any weapons involved or mentioned? No. Court documents saying that McLean was often cold and wore a runner's mask and jacket even on warmer days. As McLean walked home carrying a plastic bag in one hand, a cell phone in the other, and earphones in his ears, then Officer Nathan Woodyard tried to stop him. Your favor, stop right there. Hey, stop right there. Stop. 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 I have a right to stop you because you're being suspicious. Well, okay. Turn around. Turn around. Rosenblatt and Rodema arrived on the scene minutes later, and the situation escalated as the officers tried to move McLean, eventually wrestling him to the ground. Give us some more units. We're fighting them. Woodyard put McLean in a neck hold, which was eventually released. An officer described McLean as having, quote, yeah, crazy strength. A paramedic gave McLean ketamine to sedate him before loading him into an ambulance. McLean's heart stopped en route to the hospital. He went into a coma and died three days later. Now, after four years, two of the three officers who responded that night are on trial. Their attorney saying they followed procedure and demonstrated restraint. From the contact to the force to put him in the recovery position was all pursuant to their training and all the student to the policy. The prosecution relaying more grim details of McLean's death. When the autopsy is performed, his lungs are twice the weight of a normal person's. 
And you'll hear that in his lungs, there's digestive material and digestive fluid because he's been inhaling his own vomit. The defense largely blaming McLean's death on the paramedics who administered the ketamine. But then when paramedics arrive on scene, the paramedics have full medical control. The two paramedics have pled not guilty to manslaughter and negligent homicide. They're scheduled for trial in November. A critical care expert suggesting the ketamine was just one factor. Was the ketamine, in your opinion, the only thing that caused Mr. McLean's death on the night that he died? In my opinion, it was not. It was also the position that he was put in that reduced his ability to cough. One thing both sides agree on, McLean's death should never have happened. Now his family and friends waiting to see who a jury believes is responsible. Aaron Gilchrist is joining us now. Go back to this uh, piece about the paramedics here and the ketamine, because uh, the coroner at first could not determine exactly how Elijah McLean died. Revised coroner's report said it was from complications from the ketamine after being forcibly restrained. Right. Does what happened with these officers, is there any potential that that could affect the trial of the medics? So the judge separated all the trials. There are five trials that are going to, or five people who are being tried here eventually. And I, I think what you're going to see is, as we, you know, the prosecution believes that all five of them are equally responsible, that they're all guilty of the charges, the things they've been charged with. The defense here made very clear that it's trying to shift the blame to the two paramedics who administered the ketamine. And that is the case that they're trying to make through this trial. So it'll be interesting to see how that fits into the trial of the two paramedics when that starts in November uh, and whether there might be some some sort of cross testimony in, in trying to trying to shift blame in this instance. But again, the prosecution is saying that all five of these people are responsible for Elijah McLean's death and they want them all to be held responsible equally. Aaron Gilchrist, thank you very much for staying on top of the story for us. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Azerbaijan, the separatist government of Nagorno-Karabakh says it's going to dissolve itself and will no longer exist by the end of the year. So this is significant. Remember, we talked about this conflict earlier in the week. This is essentially going to end this 30-year fight for independence from Azerbaijan. Armenian officials say more than half the region's ethnic Armenian population has already left since this military blitz by Azerbaijan there last week. Out of Greece, hundreds of people have evacuated and thousands of homes have been flooded after a huge storm hit the central part of the country. Look at this. People are like literally digging out at this point. Fortunately, no deaths have been reported at this point. It is the second big storm in that area in less than a month. Out of Hong Kong, a wine collection worth $50 million could soon be yours. This very uh, rich billionaire is sending, selling 25,000 bottles. Sotheby's says it's the most expensive collection of wine to ever come to sale. Some bottles, like one single bottles, one single, like one bottle, $100,000. That is, that is an expensive glass of wine. Power to you if you got it. Coming up, some new warnings tonight about what younger men are seeing on TikTok, specifically on steroid talk. What this new report says it means for teenagers and what they want Congress to do about it. That's coming up. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, starting Sunday, starting Sunday, guess what? You got to start repaying your student loans. Tens of millions of people will have to pay up off what they borrowed. But some experts think that could slow down spending, maybe even enough to drive the economy into a recession. That's the concern. NBC's Maura Barrett has more. Borrowers around the country know what October 1st means. Student loan repayments resume after a three-year pause. More than 40 million borrowers owe student debt, now totaling more than $1.7 trillion in the U.S. Experts estimate borrowers will start repaying an average of about $350 a month. That's significant and could leave a huge dent in monthly budgets. A recent report from Credit Karma found that more than half of federal student loan borrowers say they'll have to choose between repayments and necessities, limiting consumer spending, which has been a pillar in keeping the economy chugging along. So could a hit to that spending trigger a recession? I think that we'll see the first signs of this after the, uh, the student loan forgiveness program uh, ends. This is going to be a consumer-led recession. I think will ultimately be more severe than people think into 2024. Others see student loans as a small part of the economy. Student financial aid expert Mark Kantrowitz puts it at 0.4% of GDP. He thinks the return of repayments will have little impact. It's a really tiny portion of the economy. It's not going to derail the economy. 
But people might think twice about those big ticket items. People have said that student loan payments have a domino effect, that they cause delays in people buying their first homes or their first cars or getting married. Um, and that is true. And while October 1st is seen as a hard deadline, its effects may be more gradual. The Biden administration is offering income-based repayment plans to those who might have had a tough time starting up payments again. And they could also get some relief when it comes to their credit scores. We know many of our borrowers are going to struggle to make payments, um, but we want to make sure that we're not sending their name to credit agencies. So we're going to hold them harmless for a year as they're getting back up. Amid a looming government shutdown, it's important to know even with federal loans, interest will accrue and payments are still due either way. Maura Barrett, NBC News. All right, thanks to Maura Barrett for that reporting. A new report out tonight is sounding the alarm on so-called steroid talk, calling on Congress to do more to stop younger people from seeing these videos on TikTok, promoting things like steroids. They want action here. This tech watchdog group says that people between the ages of 18 and 24 saw videos having to do with steroids and similar kinds of drugs something like 420 million times in the last few years. That may even be an undercount since there's no data on people under the age of 18. These are videos that are often encouraging, like, for example, male teenagers to take steroids, showing bodybuilders with the hashtag roids. Others are captioned things like risk it, showing people with handfuls of drugs. One user even suggests that others tell parents that the steroids are vitamins. This report says lawmakers have got to figure out how these sites are selling substances like these in the first place. I want to bring in Dr. Natalie Azar for more on this. Talk through like the risks of steroids and the way that this report, uh, it seems, is making the link between these videos being out there and then, of course, um, the promotion of the sales of those to people who are younger. Just another thing for us parents to worry about, right, Hallie? Mm -hmm. So, look, the risk of taking anabolic steroids are numerous for both boys and for girls. We're talking about things like fertility issues, impotence. Um, mood changes, aggression, heart, liver problems. And just as a little aside to parents out there, some of the first symptoms that you might notice that could clue you into your child using this are, in fact, the mood swings as well as acne. So keep an eye out for that. In terms of how these sellers are getting their hands on it, well, you know there's a black market for everything. It shouldn't be that way. The FDA has classified anabolic steroid as a scheduled three controlled substance, which means it requires a prescription as well well as some other sort of regulatory things in order to prescribe. But just like other things, Hallie, people can falsely advertise. They could say it's a vitamin. It actually contains anabolic steroids. Some of this stuff is coming from outside of the U.S. Really, really, really hard to regulate. There's a TikTok spokesperson who tells us this report isn't differentiating between what content is positive and what content is negative associated with the hashtags. When we talk about platforms um, like TikTok, I mean, listen, all these social media platforms, there's been a lot of conversation around young women with body image issues. I wonder if there also should be, and if this report is highlighting the need for conversations around young men with body image issues as well. It should. And, you know, I always feel like we sometimes do these these um, segments together, Hallie. I have a 15-year-old daughter and an 18-year-old son. Both of them are affected by, by what they see on social media. And we can't ignore that boys are also getting these messages and, and seeing these images and, you know, are trying to be just as attractive as, as girls are trying to be. And I think it's a reminder to all of us as parents to really keep an eye out on what our kids are doing on social media. Ask them what social media platforms they're using, how many hours a day they're on it, and really be a part of the conversation with your kids. That's the best way that you can protect them. Dr. Natalie Azar, so glad to have you on here. Uh, your expertise, both professional and personal, really appreciate it. Still to come here on the show, something Netflix started, now ending. We're rolling back the clock on their famous red envelopes. Here's a pop quiz. Do you know what the very first DVD Netflix ever sent was? I'll tell you in just a sec. We are a long way from Beetlejuice, the very first DVD Netflix ever tucked into a little red envelope. Because tomorrow, 25 years after that first shipment, Netflix will send out its last, a nostalgic milestone for a company that's been disrupting movie watching for a generation. Here's Noah Pransky. Dearly beloved, we gather today to pay tribute to the red envelope that changed the world. 
At just 25 years young, the Netflix DVD service is going dark, leaving behind a legacy of innovation that truly shaped a generation. Remember when we used to get those in the mail, the red envelope DVDs? There's something special about getting a package in the yeah. mail. In an era where Netflix is known as the world's dominant streaming service, with more than 238 million subscribers, You'd be forgiven if you didn't realize the company was still shipping out DVDs. Flashback to the 90s where watching a movie at home usually required a trip to your local blockbuster. But then in 1998, Netflix blew up that business model by providing movies on demand through the U.S. Postal Service. This is a DVD service. Mm -hmm. So you get, for 20 bucks a month, you get three DVDs. So you can have them come into your house and you can get some great family movies. In 2000, Netflix launched the first algorithm to recommend movies based on previous selections. A year later, it reached a million subscribers. And in 2007, as it was reaching its one billionth disc shipped, Netflix introduced another innovation. DVD rental giant Netflix today is launching a new service that lets subscribers watch movies on their computers. A streaming giant was born. Blockbuster goes out of business. And then another major market disruption as Netflix expands into content creation with hit shows like Orange is the New Black and House of Cards. I finished watch until 2 a.m. A child of the dot-com era was now going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the granddaddies of both movies and television. Television, but all the while still sending those DVDs to the homes of millions of Americans. I didn't even know that was still a thing. It's still a thing. <laughs> Until this week. It's just weird thinking about how it's something you'll tell your kids and your grandkids about and they'll think you're just a dinosaur. As a thank you to loyal subscribers, Netflix offered a final shipment of up to 10 free DVDs for customers to keep. A bitter week for some. Hey sweet for others. That is amazing. I worked for Blockbuster as a store manager back in the day. Why are you so happy about the end of the DVD? Because they put Blockbuster and me out of business. The red DVD envelope is survived by streaming giant Netflix and millions of empty mailboxes across the United States. I'm going to be honest, no, I didn't even know they were still doing the red envelopes. You know what I mean? Like, that is that is early, millennial, late 90s, I mean, all of the above. But what's so interesting is the way that Netflix is still so relevant to all of us today, right? It's not like eight tracks, if people even know what that is, like, where it's just totally a done. Netflix is still around. People still watch shows on Netflix, even with Netflix's business model starting to change Post disruption, its stock yeah. is down. They're making people, you know, cut back on sharing accounts with the password sharing, et cetera. Where does this company go? So they've really shifted in the last few years from a company focused on growth to a company focused on profits. And their stock about two years ago took a huge dive, but they've actually rebounded pretty nicely over the last 15 months or so. And even during the writer's strike, They've done pretty well, a lot better than a lot of other content creating companies. They've found a way to reinvent themselves. They've done this time and time again. And to your point, they're still around 25 years later. So I would not expect the end of the DVD mail-in service to do much to their stock price now. Allie. Our Gen Z streamer, as old as our Gen Z colleagues. Noah Pransky, thank you so much. Sure. Appreciate it. That's a wrap for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.